All right, well, hello, good morning. This is going to be a little something a little bit different today. Um, to make up for some time we lost for a for the exam on Monday, I decided to record a short lecture on uh, shear in concrete beams. This is the last section or the last material that we haven't yet to go over for concrete beams. So I just wanted to put together a short video lecture on um, calculating shear in concrete beams. All right, so my uh, learning objectives for this short video are first, describe why concrete beams need shear reinforcement, and second, calculate the capacity of a, of a, re of a reinforced concrete beam um, reinforced for shear using the ACI code. Now, um, let's see, so how can we describe shear? Well, obviously you know what shear is. You learned how to calculate it in even way back in statics. You saw that again in mechanics and materials, and you saw that again in um, structural analysis 3325. But uh, we uh, we ha we will learn when we get to steel beams. We want to learn how we will learn how to calculate um, shear for those. But we also need to be able to calculate shear for concrete beams. So um, what I have taught you so far is how to calculate the uh, flexural capacity of reinforced concrete beams. But uh, that deals with your bending moment. However, we also need to be able to work with the uh, shear component in uh, a uh, shear and moment diagram. All right, so um, let's look at a, a concrete beam in shear. So basically, I'm just going to use my standard method of some PowerPoint slides, drawings, etc. Very similar to what we do in class, except on, on some slides here instead of on the board. Now, first of all, say we have a concrete beam with a given section and maybe on some bearing plates. Although um, we have not yet learned how to design bearing plates, but hopefully if we have time, we'll get to those later in the semester. So say we have a load P and a reaction here on two bearing plates, and this is a concrete beam. So I'm gonna have a reaction here and a force here. So basically, I want to analyze how um, shear is handled in concrete beams, and then uh, from that we can learn how and why shear reinforcement stirrups work. So that is our goal here. So consider two uh, stress elements. This is going to be up in, the up in the compression zone, this will be down here in the tension zone. So if we show our um, forces here, well, we know from basic flexural theory that this will be in um, compression here. So I'm going to have compression here and tension here. But then for both of these, shear will be going in the same directions for each element. So we have compression and shear up here and tension and shear down here. So again, this is bearing plates, and we'll see those later on. However, if we remember uh, Moore's circle, so let's um, interpret this through Moore's circle. Um, if we remember Moore's circle, we remember that there are certain principal stress planes. And these are usually not occurring uh, directly at the uh, um, 90 degree angles. Okay, so usually they're going to be at some some sort of angle, and I'm in, I am purposely drawing at these at an angle instead of just my usual poor art skills. Okay, so I'm going to draw some elements at angles, indicating that we will have. Um, principal stresses at a certain angle. So um, again, this here is just showing your flexural and shear stresses and shear stresses. And here we have our principal stresses, and I will label those. Our principal stresses. And let's see, like here, here, oh, maybe something like this, this, and then maybe something like this, this, 
this, and this, just some stressed elements. And again, we still have our um, support plates here and our load plate there. Okay, now I, this is the point of this is not to do a review of um, mechanics and materials. The real point is to illustrate how um, what I really want to think about is compressive force trajectories. So what actually tends to happen here is that your compressive forces, um, they flow. We have learned before how stresses flow, how we can trace the lines of force through members, and for, um, for concrete beams, they're going to flow something like this. So your compressive forces, you have this large load P here, well it has to make its way down to the support here. So there must be lines of force carrying that compressive force from our application point down to, down to our support point. So we have that here, and my plate disappeared. And then a reaction here. Well, we're going to have lines of force and stress. And maybe they go something like that. Here. And what this tends to do is this tends to cause separation. Between the lines of force, we get a pulling force, a shear, that will be um, applied at a diagonal. So these are lines of tension, or, well, not just, not just shear, these are lines of tension that will, so in other words, you have these lines of force carrying your load P here down to your reaction, um, but lines of tension that want to pull these planes apart. Uh, so these are your compressive, um, these are your um, compressive stress trajectories. Uh, compressive stress trajectories. Or, if I then look at the where the cracks form, the cracks then, the shear cracks, will form something like this. Let me illustrate this. They will form along these planes as the tension forces separate them. That looks really bad. Okay, so we have something like this, and you're going to get tension forces or forming cracks, oh, something like this. These are your cracks that will form. So really what we want to do is we need to add, um, the problem with our um, regular moment reinforcement, or regular flexural reinforcement, is it's simply pointing in the wrong direction to uh, provide resistance to this, uh, to this tension. Now, if there is any, uh, if there is a shear ca uh, causing compression, we'll be fine because the concrete can take that um, just fine. But for the, uh, if there's any tension force, well, we know from before that, sh that concrete is crap for compression. So we're gonna have a problem. So I'm gonna save these as I go, just in case there's any sort of um, PowerPoint crashing that's happened to me before in some of these exercises. All right, so a few notes. Um, let me do a few notes on this. First, note one. Um, beam cracks um, in tension as expected. Um, beam cracks, a beam will crack as expected in tension, or uh, cracks in tension as expected. Um, as expected, uh, vertical, these are vertical cracks where moment dominates and shear is low. You get vertical cracks where moment dominates and shear is low. Or and shear is low. So if we have a case of low shear and a high moment, things will tend to crack as we saw, as we would expect, um, and as we saw previously in the course where we said cracks form at a certain location due to flexure. But um, if we have um, if we have uh, unreinforced beams unreinforced for shear, we get something different. Uh, so we get inclined cracks, inclined cracks 
where shear dominates and moment is low. This is very important, especially near the um, support elements when shear um, dominates and moment is low. Is low. So, I mean, remember your, uh, say, like a simply supported beam. Consider a simply supported beam under a, un a uniform loading. If you have a simply supported beam under uniform loading, your shear diagram, if you remember, recall, is going to look something like this, right? Um, something like that. Or, actually, that's not quite right, but uh, anyway, no, sorry, that's not right. I, I really screwed the pooch on that one. Wow, I cannot remember my statics. Your shear diagram is going to look something like this. This is why you shouldn't do statics too early in the morning before the coffee kicks in. Okay, so your shear diagram is going to look something like this, and your moment diagram is going to look something like this. So notice near the support points, near these pin supports, your shear is at a maximum and your moment is minimum. Uh, moment is at a zero. So when we're close, your moment is min a zero actually, not just at a minimum of zero. So uh, near support points, especially, or at least near pin supports, your uh, shear is going to dominate and your moment is going to be minimum. So shear reinforcement is especially important uh, near support points. Now, uh, a second note, note two. Uh, stress predictions uh, are great on uncracked beams, uh, but we know concrete cracks. Uh, great on uncracked beams, but we know, of course, the concrete cracks but we know that concrete cracks. So again, this makes things more difficult. You, you can't predict exactly where a crack will form, so it's hard to predict the, um, the behavior. So thus we need to establish, or thus we establish that concrete will need shear reinforcement. Um, there are certain areas where, in, in, especially in regions where shear is dominant, you are going to need reinforcement. And so um, let's expand upon that now. So I want to look at a uh, free body diagram of a reinforced concrete, uh, sorry, a beam that is not reinforced for shear. So a, um, even if we do not have any resistance to shear, or even, sorry, even if we don't have any explicit um, shear stirrups or any explicit or any purposeful shear reinforcement, a concrete beam will certainly have some um, shear capacity. So let's look at how that develops just for something that, um, even for something that we haven't put any sort of shear reinforcement in. So let's look at that. I, wanted to, I want to um, produce a free body diagram for this and look at how this develops. So I'm going to do a rather interesting free body diagram. I'm going to cut out a section of a concrete beam. And basically, this edge here, it would be along one of these um, separation planes where a crack would tend to form. OK, so I'm going to have um, my reaction force on the left. I'm kind of flipping it this time. I'll have my reaction force on the left, and I still have my um, moment reinforcement, my uh, tension reinforcement in the bottom of the beam, so that's going to be important to consider. So I'm kind of coloring that in a little bit. That's my tension bars at the bottom, my rebar at the bottom of my um, beam that's carrying all my, my uh, flexural tension force. Now, um, let's see, so what do I have here? Well, I have my tension force, T. Then I have my compression force up here. My compression force here, carried by my Whitney stress block here. 
Then um, I'm going to label a few things and then I'm going to come back and describe what these are. I'm going to have something I'm going to call VD. I'm going to have something that I call uh, VCZ. And then along the plane, I will have something that I'm going to call uh, VA. And VA will have components, I will have a Y component, VAY, and an X component, VAX. And then I'll define all of these things in a table down below. So first of all, um, here, if we apply a sum of forces in a um, in the x direction, we can clearly see that um, the compression is equal to the tension. C is equal to T. C here is equal to T here, ignoring the um, a x here for now, um, because that's going to be very nominal compared to T and C. But shear is um, well, you'll see. So if I do a sum of forces in the y direction is equal to zero. Well, we have R, but what does R, what, what will R be equal to? So R must be equal to all other, all of our internal shear forces here. Well, we have three of them. That will be important. We have VCZ, we have VA, and we have VD. Okay. Um, this is, let's see, VCZ is the shear carried by intact concrete in the compression zone. Shear carried by intact, so that's Z for Z uh, direction, well, it's more of a Y direction, but anyway. Um, intact concrete in compression zone. So the, in the compression zone, the concrete is is being forced together at great uh, at, at a very with a, with very with a large force, right? It's a, it's under compression. It's carrying an immense compressive load, and we know even from basic high school physics that the um, the frictional force in a um, in a um, or on an object is equal to the normal force times the coefficient of friction. And you know, if you ever fell off your bicycle as a child and landed on pavement, you know very well that uh, concrete is a rather high friction material. So, um, if you take two um, take two um, two surfaces, two concrete surfaces, and you push them together with enormous force, they're going to be able to exert quite a great deal of shear capacity or frictional capacity, and that will result in that uh, that frictional capacity creates this shear capacity VCZ. Uh, so as long as the concrete is in compression, the, the, even if it's cracked, it's going to have um, a great deal of frictional force there, so that will be able to develop quite a bit of shear capacity. Um, VA is shear carried by something called, it's not going to be quite as large as some of the other ones, especially not as large for our steel, we'll add it later, uh, carried by, uh, let me label this a different color for emphasis, Aggregate interlock. By aggregate interlock, so this is the um, sort of like friction as well, but between the aggregates. And VD is um, VD. The D stands for dowel. Is the shear carried by dowel action? Carried by dowel action. basically all of the concrete around the um, tension reinforcement uh, by dowel action around the tension reinforcement. I cannot write. Around tension reinforcement. And then all of this combines together. Um, if I do that sum of forces in the vertical direction, actually, let me like, I think I'd like to write it back here. So I'll just put it up here. V, so yeah, this would should go, I'll say go 
here. Um, v is equal to R is equal to um, V uh, C Z plus um, V A Y. Only the vertical component of Y will contribute to the V A plus V D. Now, um, so let's move on here and consider this in more some more depth. Okay. So let's cons let's discuss some factors. That, so that's the basic idea. That's the that is how a unreinforced concrete beam will be able to carry um, shear force. But I also want to talk about how um, I want to talk about this in just a little bit greater detail. So I'm just periodically saving to make sure I don't lose these um, slides because I want to be able to post these on the website. Okay. So um, factors affecting, let's discuss factors affecting uh, shear strength of unreinforced beams. Factors affecting shear strength of unreinforced um, concrete beams. Now by unreinforced, I mean unreinforced for shear. Obviously we'll never have a concrete beam that's completely unreinforced, um, except the little lab ones we made for, except the little ones you make for like um, the flexural um, uh, test of concrete, that kind of thing. Okay, so let's talk about, so one major thing is the tension um, strength of concrete, the tensile strength of concrete. Now, in flexural design, we assume that it's zero, but um, in reality, it does exist, and it does contribute to the uh, flexural, or sorry, to the shear capacity of it, um, of concrete. Less tensile cracks, well, less tensile cracks will mean you'll get um, less, it'll mean it will be stronger in shear. So the stronger it is in tension, the stronger it will be in shear, because again, if we go back, we can see that this is a tension failure. That's what's causing these planes to separate. And um, if that happens, then we end up with um, um, needing shear reinforcement. Or actually what it does is it gives you less zones of friction um, to generate the shear capacity you need in the concrete itself. Not all concrete beams do need shear reinforcement, but uh, hopefully we'll appreciate that a bit more as we go through. Uh, longitudinal reinforcement ratio is another thing to consider. Longitudinal reinforcement is, of course, your regular, um, just flexural reinforcement. The longitudinal reinforcement ratio Let's see what this means. The longitudinal reinforcement ratio um, So if you, the more longitudinal um, the more longitudinal steel you have relative to your concrete the better um, it will do in shear more uh, longitudinal steel keeps your cracks together. Keeps cracks together. We'll keep the um, shear cracks together, or the tension cracks together. Uh, another thing is shear span to depth ratio. Wherever you're experiencing shear, your your um, shear span to depth ratio. So um, deep beam. If you have very deep beams, it's different. If you have exceptionally deep beams, things will behave a bit differently than we'll discuss here. And then really thin slabs are actually very vulnerable to shear, especially all, mainly around the supports. And there's a whole science uh, that would probably be on the scope of this course that really goes into calculating the um, uh, some of the more advanced shear reinforcement techniques for those. But anyway, um, then let's consider uh, beam size. That's obviously a factor. Beam size. 
Well, if you have bigger beams, um, let's see. If you have, it really depends on your beam size in the sense that uh, if you have bigger cracks, uh, cracks uh, away from tension steel, far away from tension steel, uh, tension steel can open wider. Can open wider. Thus, you get less aggregate interlock. Thus, less aggregate interlock. Aggregate interlock. Less aggregate interlock. And then finally, uh, axial forces. Axial forces are also important. If you have any axial forces, we haven't gotten to columns yet, but we will. Axial forces, uh, they can either close or open cracks. So this can either help you or hurt, or hurt you in shear. Um, can open slash close cracks. If you have tension applied on a concrete member, well, that can tend to open the cracks, which will reduce the um, effective shear capacity. If you have a, um, a compressive force, will actually keep uh, cracks closed, thus increasing your shear capacity. And really, that's actually one of the whole principles of, um, say, pre-stressed concrete, pre-stressed uh, post or post-tensioned concrete, is to um, keep cracks closed, and it really helps with your, and one of the things it helps with, among others, is shear capacity. But that of course is beyond the scope of, but that of, of obviously is beyond the scope of this course and you haven't uh, figured that out yet. Now um, we like, uh, as we've seen in this class, we like to um, sort of simplify things. And we, as we've seen in this and other classes, concrete's hard, concrete's very difficult. So. Um, Rather than trying to calculate V, uh, C, Z, V, A, Y, V, D, etc., you know, that is really just going to be too, um, way too complicated for us to really deal with reliably. And it's not going to be very, um, if we try to deal with, we're not going to be able to exactly predict all of those things separately. Instead, uh, our approach is to, com to, lump, to lump those things together. So approach. Let's see, our approach here fundamentally is lump um, VCZ, uh, VAY, and VD together. That's going to be our approach. And all of these lump together, uh, together, they're going to form what we call VC. V is just a single combined value for the overall shear in the concrete. Shear in concrete. Or the shear carried by the concrete itself, not the steel, but the concrete. And there is a nice equation that can be found in the ACI code, and that is that VC is going to be equal to 2 square root of F prime C uh, times BW, um, that is the beam web depth. So if you have T sections, you'll only be considering the web, the web of the T. That is web depth. And uh, this is an empirical equation, but it has been proven reliable. So it's another one of our lovely empirical equations, and you'll find a lot of RC concrete is built on these sort of rough, um, ugly empirical equations. So these, this is empirical, and is valid for typical design ranges. But it is valid for most of your typical beams. What you'll see, anything you'll see in this class. Uh, valid for typical design ranges.
Okay, so next I want to, uh, so we now, um, we have this VC. And this is the, um, again, the shear that can be relied on or that will be carried by concrete, by the concrete itself in an, a reinforced concrete beam. So then the question becomes though, what if um, I have a shear and moment diagram for my beam and I know that the shear that I need to carry at a location is greater than this VC? What happens if um, I do a calculation and I find that the concrete alone is not going to be enough? Um, well, suddenly I have a problem. So I need to add what are known as shear stirrups or shear reinforcement. S <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, so again, I need, uh, I need to add steel specifically just to deal with the, um, the uh, shear forces in the uh, member. So again, let's, sh let's uh, save that. And this is actually kind of what I was worried about. PowerPoint, for some reason I'm recording, tends to be a bit um, unstable sometimes. Well, at least I'll have the video. All right, let's see. So this is still recording. Okay, so let's see. Sorry about that. The perils of recording in one take. All right, task manager time. Okay, it's killed. Um, let's see if it actually saved a copy of that. Well, we did lose some stuff. Actually, let's see what this is. Nope, we lost it. Oh well, that's what the recording is for. Yeah, PowerPoint's proven rather unreliable. I guess I won't be posting the slides for this. Okay, anyway, I'll just use it as a canvas. Let's see. So let us consider a free body diagram uh, for a beam reinforced and shear. So let's look at a free body diagram for a beam reinforced and shear. So the very very similar thing to what I did look at previously, but this will be a beam reinforced for shear, explicitly for shear, or specifically for shear. Beam reinforced for shear. So I'm going to have, um, if I look at the cross section, we are going to have what are known as shear stirrups. And please be aware that what we go over in this class really greatly simplifies the procedure. Um, in reality, there are many requirements for, say, covers, cover requirements, the amount of concrete that must be between uh, different elements, things like that. We, uh, just by, because of the, the abbreviated nature of this course, I have to cut out a lot of, I have to often cut out a lot of things that are important if you're actually designing, but um, this is more of a principles class, so. There you have it. At least in terms of the, um, at least in terms of the actual, um, there are some minutia of design that we have to leave out that are, that is very important, especially for, um, especially for, um, say, like cover depths and things like that. So your shear stirrups will kind of look like this. You have um, maybe some t tension steel in the top, bottom and the top. And maybe this, sh this would be to carry negative moment and positive moment. And then your shear stirrups will go and wrap around all of this. So this is the, again, the cross section. And um, so fundamentally, we need to be aware that shear stirrups are perpendicular to the axis of the beam. Uh, stirrups are perpendicular to axis of beam. to axis of beam. So if I then draw a free body diagram of this, or a free body diagram, let's take a look at what this looks like. So I want to draw something very similar, except I'm going to simplify it a bit. Instead of drawing a curve, I'm going to draw it at a 45 degree angle. 
So I'm going to make an assumption that this um, that this shear failure occurs at a 45 degree angle. So this is um, theta, or it's going to be at I, I could assume any the angle, but I'm going to actually going to end up assuming a 45 degrees. So I'm assuming a slip line or a failure plane at a certain theta. And then I'm going to only show y forces, just to simplify things, because I'm interested in shear here. I'm only interested in y forces. And I'm going to have, let me, oh, it's a little too high up. So let's say I have my shear reinforcement here, or sorry, my, my regular longitudinal reinforcement here, and then I have, um, then I have various pieces of shear reinforcement along the way. Various lines. So these are lines of shear reinforcement. Each of these vertical ones is a stirrup. Now, I'm going to need to label a few dimensions. I have my theta. Uh, the length, the longitudinal length of this plane, I'm going to call D for now. And um, then the spacing between is going to be S here. So um, I'm going to assume that uh, theta is 45 degrees, which is a reasonable assumption. Theta equals 45 degrees. And um, I'm also going to assume the, stir the stirrups yield. So because of this 45 degree angle, the, um, the failure plane is going to intersect multiple shear stirrups. So um, assume theta equals 45 degrees, and also assume steel yields. Um, stirrups um, yield. So um, therefore, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to have a quantity called um, VNS, which is the nominal capacity of the nominal shear capacity of the steel, equals um, Fy. And this D is also going to be equal to the depth of the beam, the, the depth from here down. Um, so this is Fy A time, uh, sorry, AV, the shear area, Okay, shear area. And what this means is the area of the rebar, the steel area, times D over S. D over S. And this D over S, let me provide a few, a few notes here. Let's see, this is D over S. This is the, um, the number of stirrups a crack will hit and then uh, AV again this is the shear area however it's going to be equal to two times the area of the individual bar and if you remember, if you don't remember, or if you don't know how to find the area of a, of a piece of rebar, check the table in the back of your code. Um, let's see. So again, this is twice the area of the bar because where this comes from is we say this is made from like number three or number four rebar, and one stirrup will have two bars in it. That's why we need to multiply. That's why the AV is twice the area of, of an individual bar. Then um, let's look at the ACI capacity. The ACI um, code basically is built around this. So the ACI, um, ACI shear capacity
for RC members or RV, RC beams reinforced for shear. Uh, reinforced for shear. Reinforced for shear. Let's see here. Well, here's the fundamental equation. Uh, phi Vn is equal to phi times, so this is, um, phi of course is our strength reduction factor. Vn is the nominal overall shear capacity. So that's going to be include this, the concrete and the steel. So phi plus uh, times V concrete plus V and S. That's the one of the um, shear capacity of the steel is equal to phi times um, our previous two root F prime C uh, times B W. D plus Fy, the yield strength of the steel, times the shear area, times the beam depth over the spacing. Um, and this is found in, uh, and, and by the way, our phi is going to be equal here uh, to 0 0.75. And this is found in section 22.5. ACI section 22.5. We also have a, um, a limit to how far apart our shear spacing can be. There is a max shear spacing limit to be aware of. Um, so we can't uh, shear stirrup spacing. You are not allowed to place them more than D over 2 or um, 24 inches apart whichever is smaller. So it's the min of these. Um, you can't place your stirrups more than 24 inches apart or um, more than uh, half the depth of the beam. And this is ACI uh, 9.7.6.2.2. And I checked that's the new code. So um, also another thing to keep in mind, if um, V of steel is greater than four f prime c, square root of f prime c. Um, let's see, uh, four f primes. The v, sorry, the if the overall shear capacity of the steel is greater than four root f prime c, uh, b w times d. You have to reduce the strength. Um, there is a reduced max spacing, and you'll have to. You may read about that in the code. That's a bit more complicated, but uh, hopefully you don't encounter that. There is a reduced max spacing requirement. Um, in other words, if concrete is uh, if, if concrete if the, if the reinforced concrete is get, getting all of its shear or most of its shear capacity from steel, remember this we're assuming that the steel yields. It's going to be carried up to the yield. So this means that if we if all of your concrete is just being held together by um, steel effectively, this means that it can rip out and it can fail suddenly, which is not something we want to. Uh, we don't want our um, concrete beams to be that um, prone to failure. There is also a requirement for minimum shear steel. Minimum shear steel. Uh, minimum shear steel. And this is, this applies whenever, uh, whenever V ultimate, your ultimate shear load, your ultimate factored shear load is greater than 0 0.5 um, phi times um, v of concrete, and this is um, so. This is a minimum. This isn't spacing. This is minimum shear steel. So if your ultimate shear load is ever greater than half the factored capacity of the concrete alone, they say 
you know what, I don't care what your calculations say, you need at least some shear stirrups. Um, and this applies except in all beams, uh, except um, for slabs, footings, slabs, some others. You can read about it in the code. And this is um, ACI 9.7.6.2.2 as well, that same section. And the minimum shear area for this equation is going to be AV min is equal to 0 0.75 uh, square root of F prime C a square root of f prime c, bw, s over fy, which is greater than or equal to um, 50 uh, bw, uh, s over fy. So either of these, um, basically you just go for the larger one. You, th these are um, two um, limit states. These are based on two different limit states, and you calculate the minimum shear area for each of, uh, of each of these cases, and then you just um, go with a larger one. And again, the whole point of this, as a reminder, is um, prevents sudden shear failure. Now, um, I would like to give you one final note on shear, and if you're not aware, um, the only stirrups that we really use are only use number three or number four um, bar shear stirrups. In other words, you know, if you need, you're not going to use a um, a number eight or a number nine just because of um, one it's uh, very hard because uh, it's very hard to make them for one if you have um, you know stirrups need to be made by bending a piece of rebar uh, and so if you have a very um, large cross section or a very large diameter that 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 be that um, that piece of rebar actually has a substantial bending moment capacity which means that it's very hard to bend into a stirrup so generally um, the only shear stirrups we're going to use are number three or number fours Maybe you might find some crazy um, exceptions out there using fives or sixes, but I would be uh, surprised. Generally, so yeah, in this class at least, um, I never want to see you use anything other than a number three or number four um, shear stirrup bar. And um, if you need more capacity, you simply lower your spacing. You just use um, more of them um, closer together. All right, well, that concludes my um, short uh, lecture on shear. My short 48 minute lecture. Uh, again, that was to make up for the time on the, um, the test on Monday, and we'll have a regular lecture moving right along to, to uh, um, steel today, to steel uh, flexural members today. All right, thank you for watching, and goodbye.